and we are live on LinkedIn. Welcome everybody to a very special FPF Friday video production. Now, the very keen-eyed among you may have already noticed that neither of us are Jules Polonetsky. <laughs> but never fret, we still aim to have a riveting and timely conversation for you all. I am Kier Lamont with the Future of Privacy Forum, and I am joined by my colleague, Tatiana Rice, Deputy Director for U.S. Legislation and lead author of a new FBF report that dropped this morning on U.S. state AI legislation. Wow, you're already link- printed. <laughs> I sure do. I rushed down at 3 a.m. local time when it went live to get myself a hard copy. <laughs> so the link to this should be already be going out in the chat. You should be able to get a copy. Uh, I'm out here in the uh, Republic of California, where the topic of AI legislation has certainly been on everybody's mind, or at least on every venture capitalist's mind. So I have the pleasure of saying good morning, Tatiana. Thank you for joining. Uh, Thanks, Kier. Um, I am here in D.C., of course, also where a lot of AI conversations are happening. But I think we're really uh, excited to have this particular report come out on state legislation, because that's really where we've seen a lot of the action taking place this past year. So as I'm sure a lot of folks who are listening in are aware of, uh, at Future Privacy Forum, Kira and I really closely track state and federal legislative developments as long as well as our colleagues, Bailey Sanchez and Jordan Francis, across privacy and biometrics and AI and other forms of technology. But 2024 was really the year that AI legislation took off and kind of took center stage. <clears throat> and as a lot of folks, again, also know from this past year, there was hundreds and hundreds of AI related bills being introduced and moving through the states. So our role, of course, is to try to cut through the noise, right? How do we identify the key issues, the key debates, look at what's moving, what's getting enacted and where the trends are heading. So that's what this report aims to do, right? So analyzing the most important and key proposed and enacted state legislation on AI. And not only is our analysis really based on all of the different pieces of legislation that we looked at this past year and analyzed, but also our conversations um, and feedback with the lawmakers that we have relationships with, civil society organizations, civil rights groups, and industries. So I think it is a really good report. I am very happy about it because I do think it not only tries to get at for policymakers, right, this being more policymaker resource, um, the framework of how things are progressing and key issues they should be thinking about so they're not Uh, thrown off when they do come forward as they're thinking about legislative uh, movement next legislative session. Great. So picking up on one point that you mentioned, hundreds and hundreds of bills, this report fortunately is not hundreds and hundreds of pages, and it focuses in on uh, particular categories of these artificial intelligence kind of bills. And uh, when I talk to some of my friends, you know, down at the Y about regulating artificial intelligence, uh, oftentimes the most common concerns I hear are about systems that produce harmful synthetic content, uh, concerns about if the large language model is going to achieve general intelligence and do the matrix or do Terminator on us. Uh, This report does cover some of those efforts to regulate and mitigate these types of risks and potential harms, Uh, but it also seems uh, largely focused on a different category of artificial intelligence systems. And these are systems uh, that make consequential decisions about individuals. So could you speak a little bit more about what is a consequential decision uh, made by an AI system and why uh, in drafting this report did we choose to focus on a uh, legislation uh, focused on that category of technology? Yeah, definitely. And I think, first of all, hilarious. I can absolutely see you at the Y talking about LLMs with your friends. Like, very funny. Like, not a bit, I'm sure. But yeah, so in the report, we generally categorize our analysis into two main approaches, right? So one being the AI and consequential decisions approach, which focuses on specific uses of AI in particular contexts, and then the technology specific approach, which addresses particular technologies and novel risks associated with those. And that goes to like the generative AI that goes to large language models, frontier foundation models, et cetera. Um, But you're right, the, the bulk of the report really focuses on the first approach. 
uh, on AI in consequential decisions. And this does observe what we've seen across the legislative landscape, not only in laws like the Colorado AI Act, which passed and of course have kind of formed or been the baseline of a lot of other laws that we saw this past year, including Connecticut Senate Bill 2, uh, Virginia had a similar one, California AB331 from even last year. Um, but even specific sectors within that scope of consequential decisions, which oftentimes mirrors these areas already protected by existing civil rights laws. So housing, employment, education, et cetera. So we also saw bills, of course, AI and employment was a huge area, AI and healthcare, government use of AI, right? Because all these consequential decisions also affect the government's use of AI in uh, delivering government benefits or determining employee access, et cetera. And then, of course, data privacy frameworks, right? The term automated decision making, legal and similarly significant effects, has its basis in the GDPR and a lot of our state comprehensive uh, laws as well. So these bills, in terms of why we focus more on those, is because those are the ones that we have seen have some of the most traction and attention and echo a lot of the familiar language. However, uh, the generative AI approaches, frontier and foundation models are definitely on the rise, um, right? So we see a lot of those different bills in California this past session. But since the technology is still relatively new, we've kind of seen lawmakers more inclined to focus more on these well understood technologies with kind of established risk and mitigation strategies. Interesting. Um, so, so a point you raised, you, you mentioned we already have some kind of anti-discrimination laws on the books or already uh, consumer privacy laws on the book that deal with uh, how our data can be collected, used and shared. And so I think a question that a lot of people have asked, uh, do we even need new AI laws in the first place? Don't our existing legal regimes uh, apply whether or not our uh, data is processed on an automated or non-automated basis. So could you talk a little bit more about how do these bills you're tracking on uh, high-risk AI systems, how do they kind of supersede, augment, or kind of clarify uh, or interact with the existing uh, legal landscape? Yeah, it's a really good question, and one that comes up all the time. Um, the main issue is that civil rights laws are lagging very far behind where the technology is nowadays. So there actually is pretty broad consensus that AI doesn't exist in the Wild West, that civil rights laws in theory should already apply to AI being used in these areas like employment, education, housing, credit, etc. But these laws were written largely in the 60s and 70s for a physical world not even considering that the internet was going to become a thing. So as a result, you know, applying these protections and laws to AI has been very slow with really limited guidance. So civil society groups really note that, especially as these systems are becoming more embedded into critical decision-making context in healthcare, determining diagnoses, determining who gets a job, determining who gets a promotion, determining people's access to benefits, um, people should be aware of that being used. And that is a particular concern in the civil rights realm when we're thinking about the courts and how like those kind of cases proceed judicially, right? So if an AI is making a decision and that decision is getting appealed to a court, courts oftentimes aren't supposed to be substituting their own judgment for that of the uh, decision maker. But then with AI, we have the black box problem, right? So decision-making process is opaque. So that kind of lack of clarity makes it harder for courts to, to review or overturn any of these decisions. So in the context of all of that ambiguity and gaps and where the civil rights law and litigation is right now, even industry is like, we would love to have some guidance on what this means. We don't want to be having discriminatory systems. Um, but we don't really have guidance from, you know, the regulators on what that means and what they should be doing to mitigating these risks. So that's kind of where these laws come in. They aim to provide that level of clarity and specificity to track or tackle that challenge. And the similar situation is with data privacy laws. And that's, I know, something that us at FPF are very, very familiar with and trying to tackle ourselves is like, how do these data privacy laws apply to AI? Um, one thing that I do talk to some law lawmakers about is can you can you do both and as existing data privacy laws are in the us right now their goal is to mitigate privacy risks right so 
they require risk assessments. Those risk assessments are usually based on the data and the privacy risks associated with that data, not whether that data is biased or being used in a kind of discriminatory way. So even though these issues are really linked, uh, discrimination, privacy, bias, um, the current frameworks are kind of falling short. So privacy laws do have these anti-discrimination provisions in them, which is definitely good, um, but it still runs into the same issue of not providing any specific guidance on what that means. What does it mean to not process data in a discriminatory manner? Um, and I'll just end with this because I think it's really important to note the risk of discrimination from AI is very well documented. It's also extremely logic driven, right? So a lot of people use AI systems because they can scale the productivity. It's more efficient. And therefore you can kind of scale discrimination if bias is embedded in those AI systems, right? So if a human is screening 50 resumes a day, the human has their own preconceived biases, um, they're only gonna be able to get through a certain number. An AI system, again, being so much more able to be efficient for a lot of good reasons, right? Really, really helpful in a lot of ways. But if it's biased, like that's going to be 500, 5,000 people who potentially are unfairly discriminated against. And so it just amplifies the problem exponentially. And there's also the, kind of that argument that, okay, but humans can be more biased than machines. Why create these AI specific laws um, where you're incentivizing uh, regulation of an AI system, which might be better than a, a human decision-making process. But I think it kind of misses the point, right? I think the kind of goal here is less punitive and more about creating a checks and balances system, right? So where both humans and AI is kind of working to check each other's biases, right? An AI su supervising, doing some of these contexts where you can uh, test and get rid of some of the biases that might be in data sets that oftentimes humans can identify and also the other way around, right? So being able to have that checks and balances system allows for better mitigation of risks and kind of creating fairer outcomes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think you've raised a uh, re really interesting point here. There's uh, when are the uh, AI systems kind of making the decisions? Uh, but in practice, we know that it won't always be the AI doing every stage of the decision-making process. And in many cases, will be a human in the loop or a human kind of making the final decision. In some cases, that individual may be really making them the decision themselves, and the AI system could just be assisting in some capacity. Or in other cases, a human could just be serving as a rubber stamp on the AI system. So figuring out uh, which of these systems are or are not uh, in scope uh, based on kind of the role they have in making some of these consequential decisions seems like a really nuanced and tricky, but ultimately extremely important uh, question for lawmakers to deal with here. Because uh, not getting that balancing right could leave uh, law over-inclusive, uh, regulating low-risk uh, clearly socially beneficial tools, or if it's under-inclusive, uh, maybe some of these uh, potentially harmful, potentially biased systems could escape coverage, and then what has been achieved uh, at the end of the day. So could you drill down kind of on that point a little bit, what level of involvement uh, do these systems have to have in a decision-making process uh, to fall in, in the scope of these laws, and how are uh, lawmakers seeming to approach uh, that question? Yeah, I mean, you and I and some of our colleagues have been thinking about this for the past year, I think, almost now at this point, like really trying to hone down on the different definitions here, because they are so complex. And it is oftentimes like the really key issue when you're putting forth an AI law. So in the report, we do dedicate a lot of time just talking about scope and definitions, which is oftentimes the most challenging issue for lawmakers, right? a lot of lack of consensus about what AI means, what is the role of the AI system has to play in the decision-making context, as you know. So in the report, we break it down into kind of five different components. One being the definition of artificial intelligence. Luckily that issue is pretty much um, done with because most folks internationally and federally in the States agree that the consensus definition from OECD is the one that we're gonna go with. So. That one's pretty straightforward. The second factor is the relevant context in which the law applies. So we kind of already talked about this. 
Usually this focuses on the areas already protected by existing civil rights laws. Usually the, the decision in that process uh, needs to have a legal or similarly significant effect. Um, and then, but the third is what we're talking about here, which is what is the impact and role that the AI system has to have on the decision to bring it within scope? Um, because as you know, determining the impact is really important because AI systems do vary so widely from like really simple algorithms to more complex autonomous uh, technologies and not all of them have the same level of influence on decisions and approaches do need to be more targeted towards the system in order to exclude some of those uh, more low risk systems that we rely on and don't have that same kind of risk to consumers. So in the report, we outline the three main thresholds that we've observed. So the lowest threshold being the facilitating decision making threshold, which we initially saw in the CPPA draft regulations on automated decision making technology. Um, that is seen in a couple other bills, but actually the CPPA ended up uh, revising their definition to substantially faci facilitate, which brings it closer to what the median threshold is, uh, which is substantial factors. So that was kind of debuted in Connecticut Senate Bill 2 by Senator Maroney, and then ultimately was enacted in the Colorado AI Act. So the AI's output has to play a substantial factor in the decision-making process a lot of questions on what that definition means um, that I'm sure will continue to be discussed, but that is for now the kind of middle ground. And then the highest threshold is controlling factor. So this was first debuted in California AB 331, um, was originally in some of the bills earlier this year, like Virginia's bill, HB 747, where the AI output has to be a controlling factor in the decision-making uh, context, but the issue that lawmakers are really grappling with is finding that right balance, right? So industry representatives argue that broad thresholds like facilitating factor, maybe even substantial factor could unintentionally regulate some of these low risk technologies like calculators, spreadsheets, which might not even be considered AI. Even tools that can support decision making, right? Like scheduling assistance um, might not have these legal or similarly significant effects on consumers in terms of the risks that we're trying to mitigate, but civil society, civil rights organizations worry that more narrow thresholds like controlling factor, maybe even again, substantial factor, allow organizations to sidestep responsibilities just by having a quote unquote human in the loop, um, overlooking some of the ways that AI systems can continue to produce discriminatory outcomes. And unfortunately, our report concludes that no approach has fully satisfied either group or found language that folks can agree on. So that unfortunately will remain open and hopefully the next legislative session we'll see a little bit more about that. Well, that's a very helpful uh, foundation and sounds like there's still uh, work to do in this space. Uh, on another issue, uh, one thing I've often found kind of uh, working in tech policy is people talk about kind of the tech stack there are differently kind of situated organizations in a marketplace. And when it comes to regulation, some of the rights and responsibilities that may be appropriate for consumer facing organizations to provide uh, may not uh, be appropriate from for some of the other organizations that are B2B or more behind the scenes or more building the products in, in the first place. Uh, so can you talk through a little bit about how lawmakers are approaching uh, role specific uh, requirements uh, in these bills? Yeah, so this is actually an area where you can see lawmakers growing in their understanding of the technology and the AI lifecycle. Um, and we do discuss this in the report. So almost all of the laws that we've seen do make a clear distinction between developer and deployer or employer or whatever entity you're saying, healthcare entity, government, deployer, et cetera, where going to give an overview of the AI life cycle. I'm sure more technical folks on the call will be able to drill in more, but my general understanding is developers are responsible for kind of creating the system, uh, determining its intended purpose and scope, gathering and pre-processing the data in order to train the model based on their kind of lab conditions, um, designing the algorithm, doing all of that, doing any kind of evaluation optimization. That's what they're set on. And therefore, because that is their role in the life cycle, 
their requirements look closer to testing the systems, doing documentation of the systems, and providing that documentation and transparency to the deployers when they're being used, um, and making sure the deployers are kind of fulfilling their obligations on their end. And like it's fairly similar, honestly, to what we see between controller and processor. Um, where de uh, deployers, on the other hand, of course, are the ones deploying the technology, using the technology, and they're the ones who are directly interacting with individuals and ultimately deciding how an AI system is being used in the real world context. In some cases, they also will use what's called transfer learning, which means that the system is going to be trained on their own data, therefore it might perform slightly different, might perform significantly different than how the developer intended it to. So they also oftentimes have to do their own kind of assessments um, having more of a AI governance framework, uh, managing the risk through a risk management program, um, and providing the kind of consumer rights that are afforded in some of these laws. Uh, thank you. So uh, you've spent a little bit of time talking about how these emerging frameworks are seeking to establish uh, and place obligations on businesses to support kind of the safe, fair, and effective uh, development and use of these systems. But I also wanted to ask about the uh, consumer uh, side of the equation. If I am an individual and I'm protected by one of these laws, uh, do I get to say, I, I don't want to be subject to one of these systems whatsoever? Or do I get to say, I, I don't agree with the, the output that decision made about me. I, I contest that. I, I want a human to take a look. How are lawmakers seeking to not just place obligations on businesses, but also empower individuals? Yeah, so this has a broader spectrum of what approach lawmakers are taking, to be honest. Uh, so what we often see, though, is a huge focus on transparency from civil society organizations. Consumers need to know that an AI system is being used and how it operates, what is the logic, what is the data being used in order to have any kind of semblance of recourse if something does go wrong. And that can be through their existing civil rights or through this kind of mechanism through any kind of specific law. Um, Colorado kind of takes it a step further. Also see this in the Minnesota consumer data privacy law. If an adverse decision is made, allowing consumers to have more information as to why the decision was made what data the decision was based on and the right to correct that data or appeal to a human. So that looks like, for example, if an AI system is kind of ranking algorithms and I am applying to a job and I have on my resume that I went to an HBCU and the AI system was not trained on uh, HBCUs for whatever reason, um, and they automatically deny my application because they say, you did not go to college, that transparency allows me to know there was a mistake made and that I should be able to correct that mistake and say, hey, I did go to college. Uh, can you review this um, so I could potentially have a different outcome? Um, and there is a lot of pushback on this, to be honest. Um, but the alternative to that, what we've seen is the right to opt out com completely. Right. And that's what we see in California is the right to opt out of any kind of automated decision making system. Uh, and that right oftentimes has to be uh, exercised before the system is used, right? Where this adverse decision notice happens after and the right to appeal happens after a decision is made. So end of the day, again, there are kind of these two different approaches um, on top of existing transparency requirements. Is this going to be burdensome? Yes, absolutely. Um, but the relevant question is, do the costs outweigh the benefits? So like when you're talking about people's abilities to get jobs, to obtain financing, being denied benefits, the costs don't necessarily outweigh the benefits. Um, but making that happen, maybe the state needs to have a better uh, system, a regulatory sandbox, ways to assist organizations in making that process happen. Um, and that's some considerations that we have in the report where sometimes there are situations where consumer rights exercising them aren't just aren't feasible. And we see that in data privacy laws as well, right? There are specific situations where you can't always have consumer rights because it just isn't feasible. But these rights do exist in other laws. These aren't completely new. As I noted before, there's a lot of them already in some of the data privacy laws as it relates to opting out of automated decision making systems. But things like the right to appeal, already you kind of see in FICRA, right? You have the right to contest decisions. Of course, there's gonna be nuances between that context of uh, doing a right to appeal 
in employment versus healthcare versus credit. Um, and that they're going to have to do some more guidance around that because those are very specific, different contexts. But it, it, those are really interesting uh, dynamics that that I'll be looking to watch. Uh, thank you. So I think we've given a kind of fantastic overview of kind of the range of kind of definitions, uh, substantive rights and protections that lawmakers are kind of considering in the realm of high risk AI systems. But you and I have been around the block a time or two, and we know that when it comes to the debates, oftentimes when it comes to the lobbying about developing uh, new uh, regulatory approaches, oftentimes just as much time and attention is paid to questions of enforcement, uh, not just the substantive uh, provisions. So where do you see lawmakers landing uh, on questions of uh, enforcement in this space? Yeah, so it looks pretty similar to what we've seen in data privacy land, which is largely avoiding the private right of action. Um, of course, a lot of civil society, civil rights organizations don't love that, but there could be the argument about using some of the transparency requirements here to support existing laws. But honestly, it's an issue that we have no idea what's really going to happen until it happens, right? This intersection between existing civil rights law and these AI specific laws. And that's a huge issue that these regulators and lawmakers are going to have to grapple with. Um, and there's a couple different ways that lawmakers are trying to approach this because I think they are trying to not be punitive, trying to be more guiding in this, especially these first movers. So there are some kind of ways that they are, one, trying to promote transparency with the government and to providing, uh, I guess, kind of like safe harbors for organizations who are trying to do the right thing. And that looks like affirmative defenses, compliance with the existing NIST AI RMF, um, right to cures, interoperability with, for example, the EU AI Act, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens on enforcement. So the Colorado AG has a lot of rulemaking authority and I do think we'll end up seeing a lot of what they're thinking in that rulemaking, unclear when that rulemaking might happen. Uh, but they will definitely, I think, start to set the stage of what these enforcement actions might look like on, alongside, I think, enforcement happening across other jurisdictions. And I don't mean that just in terms of state, but also in terms of the FTC and other attorney generals are starting to enforce against uh, AI practices under their existing UDAP laws or potentially enforcing under data privacy laws. So I think this next question of enforcement of these laws, and I know you and I and the rest of our team have talked about this, is kind of going to be the next step in how the law is being clarified, refined, used, interpreted. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your, your time. This has been an incredibly uh, enlightening uh, conversation. I uh, once again encourage everyone to uh, download and uh, read the report. It is definitely something you want to be aware of before we uh, start to go into the next uh, legislative session and just see uh, more and more lawmakers respond to these uh, concerns uh, of their constituents in the development and use of these high-risk AI systems. So, uh, Teddy Ann, was there anything uh, you would like to say in closing uh, before we uh, wrap this uh, live? Yeah, I mean, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I do want to address one of them, which has to do with basically banking and finance industry. And so one thing that state lawmakers in particular are really concerned about is duplicative regulations and conflicting regulations. So when it comes to heavily regulated areas like banking, finance, even healthcare to some extent, there are some level of exclusions for entities that are already regulated under what they call kind of like same or similarly stringent uh, AI standards or regulations or otherwise have to go through. For example, like the, FD, the FDA has like a process that you have to go through in order to get like certain AI systems approved. So they are trying to avoid that and again, to what extent these federal laws are already going to be covering these same kind of risks and need to be outside of the scope of these state laws is going to be continuing to be a conversation that happens. And we'll see how things unfold as more, honestly, regulatory agencies on the federal level start taking on this approach as well. Kira, anything more you want to say? You're involved in this too. 
I, I again, I think it's a fantastic uh, report, and uh, thank you, Tatiana, for your leadership uh, on this work and putting it out uh, into the field. And thank you to uh, everyone in the audience uh, for joining uh, us on on your Friday. And uh, have have a good one, everyone. Thanks, Gear. Thanks, all.